So it's uh, time to start our, our meeting here on November 9th, 2022. It's 7 p.m. This is the Ward 1 Neighborhood Planning Assembly meeting. And um, I'm your facilitator. My name is Tom Darenthal. And uh, I think we're going to start by uh, going through introductions and then announcements. So could we start here with Carol? Sure, I don't know if people can hear me from this angle. Nope. Okay, I'll, I'll just move over. Okay. Okay. If you want, I can put it. No, 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 no. That's okay. It's okay. Hi, I'm Carol Livingston. Um, I live on Calarco Court. I'm a member of the steering committee. Um, and I just want to introduce a couple of folks who we never <laughs> introduce, who are sort of the bulwark of what gets us going here every meeting. Um, Charlie Giannoni is actually, he, he works for CCTV, but I think does a lot also probably volunteers to do our meetings. He is a member of the NPA and long, long, long term of, of NPA two and three, wards two and three. And then uh, Sam Heinrich is our CEDO liaison. He is a full-time student at UVM. He is a junior. He is carrying a full load as well as uh, 20 hours for us. Um, so these two folks uh, work with us pretty regularly to help be sure these meetings happen. So I just want to recognize them for the chat. Um, Carter? Yeah. Uh, my name is Carter Newbizer. I'm over on Colchester F. And I'm a steering committee member now, officially. Maya? Here? <laughs> Hello, thank you. I'm so delighted to be here. Uh, my name is Maya Brandt, and I will be running to be the East District um, City Councilor. So it's so nice to meet you. Hello, Zariah. I'm Jonathan Chapel Sokol. I live on North Prospect Street, and I'm on the steering committee. and And I just want to point out, also, Carol, that was really nice what you said about these folks. Sam helps out all the NPAs, which is an enormous amount of work. It's not just us, and we're really grateful that he does that. Hi, I'm Angie Chapel Sokol. I live on North Prospect Street, and um, I too thank the gentlemen who run this, and I'm not talking about the political part, I'm talking about the technical part. Hello, I'm Robert Bristow Johnson, and I'm visiting you. I'm, I live in Ward 7, so uh, um, I'm here just for an, a specific issue, and it'll happen eventually tonight. Uh, Richard Hilliard, live on Highgrove Court in Ward 1, perhaps temporarily in Ward 1. <laughs> Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Erhard Monka. I live uh, down in the old East End at 60 Grove Street. Uh, been a member of this in NPA uh, since the very beginning in 1983. Hi, I'm Troy Hedrick. I live on Billadu Court and will be representing uh, Chittenden 15 at the Vermont House starting January 4th. So, hi. And I believe we have some announcements. Jonathan, you want to talk about Prospect Street? Oh, oh shoot. Um, we have people online. Uh, Sophie, you want to introduce yourself? Uh, Sophie, uh, Sophie Quist from uh, I live in Chase Street in the Old East Old End. Congratulations, Sophie. Bye. And Zariah? Hi, Hi. it's Ray Hector, she, her. I think all of you know me. Sorry, I'm joining remotely again, but I'm not sorry that I'm in New Orleans right now because the weather's lovely. <laughs> all right. Um, announcements. Jonathan. We do? Hello. I can't, I can't um, see them. Hi, it's Sharon Busher. I'm remote also. Okay. Hi, Sharon. And I live on East Avenue. <laughs> oh, there we go. 
And there's someone else? Sarah? Sarah? Hi, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, Sarah Flash, oh, I don't have any light on. Oh, well. Um, so yeah, I also live off of East Avenue, uh, Ward 1. Thank you. All right, did I miss anyone online? No? All right, thank you all for coming. And I think we have some announcements. Jonathan. Um, I just want to... Uh... In, hi, in case you're curious what's going on on North Prospect Street, I got an update from Rob Goulding. This is yesterday. He says, uh, in speaking with a contractor this morning, the last few sections of sidewalk will be poured today at North and Loomis, and they were. Uh, backing up curb should be completed by tomorrow. When this is done, all paving in the roadway will be done. They hope to have all drive aprons done by the end of the week or early next week, if all goes well. And I know they did all the drive aprons between North Street and at least Henry, maybe to Loomis. Uh, in the last day or so, right? Um, when I asked him a little further, <clears throat> Rob said he thought that there was a very good chance that North North, uh, North Prospect Street would be pl shovel ready, plow ready by the end of next week. So we may see a two-way street again in by Thanksgiving, at least. Thank you. Do we have other announcements from people online? Seeing none, uh, there is, uh, I do have one announcement and that's it. Uh, we'll be having a candidate forum for the uh, position of uh, East District uh, City Councilor. That's gonna be next week, it's on the 16th. And for those who wanted to uh, see that in person, it's gonna be right here on North Prospect Street and there'll be a Zoom uh, option as well. Any other? Announcements. Shifting anything for speak out. Um, Thanks, Tom. Um, again, Earhart Monka, uh, longtime Ward One resident. So uh, I just uh, I know Zarai is going to be talking about uh, redistricting uh, a little bit later, but I just wanted to um, uh, maybe. Uh, Remember or kick off that discussion uh, with some concerns that I have uh, around some of the most recent maps that um, have that were under consideration by the city council at its work session this past Monday. Um, in particular, um, if you go to uh, Bird Docks, um, there is a version of there are many many maps there, uh, and the one I'm going to highlight is the one that appears to be the one that is uh, being favored by a number of city councilors, potentially a majority, um, in possibly somewhat modified form, um, but it's uh, it's labeled they all have complicated labels i believe this one is called um north uh wood eight to north hill and there's a version one and a version two um thanks uh Troy's holding it up thank you so uh so much okay sure thanks thanks charlie um that that map in my opinion uh eviscerates uh what we all uh have uh, come to know and I expect love as Ward 1. Uh, it, it, is, it eviscerates the district that I used to serve uh, back when Bernie Sanders was mayor in the 80s. Uh, I mean, there have been obviously some changes over the years through redistricting uh, because of population uh, differences. But basically what this map does is it takes out um, some of the more, you know, as I think we all know, um, Ward 1 is a, a balancing act. Uh, we have the institutions, we have a lot of students, um, we have a lot of short-term renters, and then we have um, a significant number of homeowners as well. It's been a, um, as long as I've been involved, which has been 40 years at this point, it's, it's been quite the balancing act. Um, what this map does is it um, weds uh, what I would call the more stable sections um, of Ward 1, the more um, that, that have higher concentrations of home ownership um, with a portion of Ward 2 uh, and parts of Ward 8. Um, and essentially um, leaves um, the rest of and calls it Ward 8. So carves it out of Ward 1 and leaves. Um, and, and so the geography is uh, 
this new district uh, would go from approximately uh, Mansfield Avenue uh, on the east side to South Union on the west side, um, almost all the way up to Riverside uh, on the north and uh, down to Main Street on the south. Um, and basically what it leaves for Ward 1 is mostly a student district um, with um, many short-term renters and smatterings of homeowners here and there, some down in the East End, uh, the old East End, some uh, some along East Avenue and other little pockets. Um, this, in my mind, uh, completely uh, destroys uh, the sense of community that I have uh, felt, and I think that many Ward 1 residents have felt uh, for many, many years. Um, it creates what I would consider kind of a sacrifice zone um, in order to fix the problems that were created with the creation of Ward 8 um, 10, 10 years ago. Um, so I, I just want to highlight this for folks. Um, I believe the City Council um, may be voting on this fairly soon, possibly as soon as uh, its November 22nd meeting. Um, and I would urge folks who might share these concerns and considerations uh, to email the City Council by next Wednesday, um, expressing your opinion, hopefully uh, one that um, does that, that expresses concern about uh, about this uh, about this map. Uh, what I would like to see, um, and granted that Ward One has uh, increased in population. Um, and, and will uh, need some boundary changes. Um, another thing this does is it actually increases the number of students in Ward 1 uh, by dipping back across Main Street and picking up uh, part of Living Learning, Marsh Austin Tupper, Harris Millis, those uh, student dormitories and adding them into the Ward 1 mix. So increasing the student population in, in Ward 1. I think one of the principles of fairness that redistricting really should look at is uh, a more or less uh, equitable distribution uh, of student population in several different wards, uh, that being Ward 6, uh, Ward 1, uh, and whatever might become of, um, of, of Ward 8. Um, so um, I, I would just urge folks to, to send in emails by next Wednesday, I believe would be the deadline for that city council meeting. And just as a quick heads up, um, later on when we discuss this more, I will be prepared to offer a motion uh, for the NPA to consider uh, to reject uh, that particular map. Thank you. Richard. Thanks. Uh, thanks. It's particularly good that Sandy's just popped up online. Uh, I'd just like to say that um, Sandy was talking about real estate uh, over the past uh, about six months ago, and just like to report that within um, about 200 yards of, of my property, and it's all in one direction, it's all south, east and west, not north, um, four properties have changed hands over the last, um, I think, three months, all gone to relatively young owner-occupiers. At least two of them were a rental, uh, and another property that's just over the, um, uh, the state line, uh, as it were, on, South Willard Street, on North Willard Street, has also gone to a, uh, a young owner-occupier. So I think that's very, very positive news for our community. Just want to, to uh, put that out there. Thank you. Sharon, you're up. Thank you. Um, so at the last NPA meeting, um, I spoke um, and Zariah was present and she was talking about redistricting. And I've been following this um, pretty yeah. carefully. And I'm not going to repeat what Earhart said, although um, I, Earhart and I both spoke at the city council meeting on Monday um, at their work session on redistricting, um, voicing concerns. There were other maps and some of them were more favorable in maintaining um, more, a, a more cohesive um, ward one that had a better distribution of the various populations that Earhart referenced. Um, but those were rejected mainly because of what was perceived as the continued gerrymandering or bizarre shape of the of Ward 8. So the criteria, just so that you all know, that the council has is that they have to respect the integrity of the new North End and the old North End, and they have to keep them separate. 
they have a criteria that they should more fairly distribute the on-campus, note on-campus student population. They are not considering off-campus students. And they are also um, looking at, um, oh, what's the other thing? Earhart, help me. Um, there's one last piece there. Um, and, and so um, in doing this, um, oh, uh, Ward 1 ended up gaining, as he said, some, some student population from across Main Street, meaning that we had to lose population someplace else. Um, and although Earhart defined it, I think, you know, to make people that are listening to this understand this means all of Brooks Avenue, all of Loomis Street that that is in currently in Ward One, all of Henry Street, all of North Street, Colonial Square. I mean, this is where most of our board and commission members come from. This is mainly where most of our elected election officials come from. Um, so it really guts the ward. Um, and, and it really changes the diversity that once was present and makes it now the remaining pieces, if that portion goes to the new Ward 8, the remaining pieces of Ward 1 are now having the same problems of the criticism that the council currently has about the current Ward 8 and the fact that it has not adequate representation of long-term residents and it's not a good spread or diverse population. And so they're leaving us with really very little to work with. And I, I think that that's problematic. No one, I wanna note that I know that, Zara, um, I'm gonna call you, I was gonna call you Zariah, but Councillor Hightower, was not present at the meeting um, because of some um, misunderstanding. So there was no representation for Ward 1 or Ward 8 during this conversation. Um, and all the other counselors live in sections that are protected and really aren't going to change very much. It felt incredibly uncomfortable and really was troubling to me to have decisions made for two wards that lacked representation at a meeting. So as Earhart said, um, I wrote a communication, which is wordy like I always am, but it, it did say if you, if you share concerns about this um, current map, please write to Lori Olberg at, at the city clerk's office and make sure that um, it can go to President Paul and, um, and the city council. And I'm hoping that on the 21st, when they, if they take this up, that there will be some input from people if you share those concerns that, that Earhart and I have referenced. Thank you. Thanks, Sharon. Uh, other people for speak out? And your name is? Peter Lukowski. Peter, you've got the floor. I just wanted to say that when Sharon was listing those streets, in my mind was flashing people I know who have been uh, political figures, activists, community figures from those very streets, active in, and re in many cases representing the ward. Um, I think it, it really is true that, that that particular neighborhood has a kind of a core property, a historic property almost, um, of, of the kind of people who get involved in things and represent the ward well. So um, I, I really agree that that's, uh, it, would be, it would be a hard thing to lose that that section of the ward um i i i just want to amplify what what they were what they both said thank you Carter? i'm just joining the course and i was going to agree with Earhart and and also just know um stand up for students a little bit you know i'm, I'm the younger guy here 
Um, I once was a student. That's why I came here. Um, and, you know, it's totally reasonable for folks like who own homes. I don't know. It's totally reasonable for us to want to build a community and like have stable neighborhoods. And our city makes a lot of money off of students. Um, the university makes up a lot of money off of students. Businesses downtown do. It drives the economy. And and certainly landlords make a lot of money off students um, in the city. And so I think that this downtown district, however it's configured, and Ward 6 and us sort of have a responsibility to, to evenly split on-campus students um, in an equitable manner. And there was an eight-ward map that basically kept Ward 1 intact after the last MPA meeting that I saw. Um, it was a new map after the last MPA meeting that did that. Um, so I don't know. So that's that's my, my preference personally. But um, yeah, I just wanted to voice that. Any other issues for speak out? Oh, do you, do you mind if I just jump in here and relinquish the redistricting part of my thing just to have it be a little bit more of a conversation? Is that okay? Yes, go ahead. Great. Um, yeah, so I think folks are generally, um, so I missed the meeting, but I went back and watched it because I had some flight changes and then some more flight changes. Um, so Karen originally moved the work session earlier so I could be there after they made the flight changes, but then that didn't work out either. Um, but I just, so, I mean, I guess I want, one, I think what Earhart had said and to have like a formal statement from the NPA would be really helpful. Um, I think I'm gonna talk about the politics of what's going on a little bit, just so folks understand. And I think that it is unfortunate that right now um, we have a little less representation. Um, so, after the last NPA meeting, we, I pushed really to have hard to have the seven word map back on the table and it was put back on the table, but then there was a city council vote. There was very little support for it beyond me. There was a city council vote to move forward with just the eight ward maps, um, which I would have been the only person to vote no on. Um, so now we're back to the eight ward. As we know, there's there's the two maps early that kind of keep Ward 1 intact. There's a portion that's closer to downtown that gets cut out, which is reasonable um, because we have to downsize in an eight ward map. Um, the South just, the South End counselors really don't like that because it adds a lot of student population to their ward, which they're fighting really hard against. And because the South End counselors are part of the Democratic coalition, I just don't have the votes right now to push back on that. So I think the biggest, it's like, I don't know if <laughs> I can only be indignant about so many maps. And so I tried to find the ones that were the least that I think would be the least popular. And I think that might be one way to phrase it is like what we absolutely can't live with. Um, there's, and so if we look at the six maps that are there, I wonder if we can kind of agree on which ones we can't do. And maybe, the, and I do want to say like, I know that folks ended up settling on, I don't know, I think they're called the North Hill or something like that, um, neighborhoods. Um, and I think there's some different things we can ask for, but I, I just, I, I think I want folks to know that everything that I'm going to ask for, I'm going to ask for as a compromise. Like that's really the only way that I can move forward is to be like, what about this? Because ultimately the two maps that I really like the top two, I think it's not just about keeping Ward 8 the way it is. It's also about the student population going so heavily to Ward 6, which isn't something that folks want to see. Um, and then, then the one, and I do think I've mentioned, Karen knows this, Ben knows this, Mark knows this. They've heard me say this so many times is Ward 1 does have a really high off-campus student population, has the highest off-campus student population. Um, and I think that continues to not really be considered um, in this debate. I don't think that that means, I, I am wary, I think Christopher has talked about this, who was in the working session, has talked about this, that it also doesn't sound good to be like, oh, we want to split up the student population into as many wards as possible. That doesn't feel good. Again, if like to Christopher's point, if we substituted any other population into that 
instead of student population. That would sound terrible if we said, oh, we want to make sure that the Black population is divided evenly into all the wards. So I don't want that to be too big of a focus, but I think keeping some of the historic boundaries, I think some of the maps, honestly, it's like, yes, they get rid of the weird Ward 8, but they also look very gerrymandered. There's little like pieces that are being cut off and very strange places. Um, but I think Earhart's suggestion of saying these, this is what we can't live with, and this is the minimum of what we ask for would be really good. And I have some ideas on what that could be, but I don't want to speak for too long during speak out. Thanks. And Thanks. That's Kathy's hand. I saw. Kathy? Yeah, I just I just wanted to know why we can't go back to seven wards and 14 um, representatives, two from every ward. I find that we're cutting, we're making these wards huge and we're, we're also not having enough representation. And I can tell you alone on the on the school board, because I'm sure we're going to go down the same path you guys are going down, is that we have an awful lot of work to do. And, you know, I'm between one and eight running back and forth. So I have three MP, uh, two MPAs and a school board every month. And that's not all the other stuff that we have to do. And I just feel like in these days, we should be adding to democracy and not cutting it back. And I feel like that's what they're doing here. Yeah, I was really frustrated. I, but like last city council meeting, I was the only counselor who wanted the seven word maps. It was the progressives don't like it because it mixes the old North end and the new North end. Then independents don't like it there because they're off in the new North end and it mixes the old North end and the new North end. And the seven ward has the same issue with ward six so the south end of that it puts all of the current ward eight students into the south end so the Democrats don't like it. <laughs> so for political reasons, nobody likes it, even though I think it makes the most sense for our city. So I think, but I think as if there were a few counselors and I just had to convince some it would be possible, but as me being the only counselor who supports the seven ward by two map right now, I think unfortunately it truly is off the table. Would you like some information from somebody outside of ward one? Um, I'm, I'm sorry, the chair. I forgot your name. My name is Robert Bristow Johnson. Robert, you've got the floor. Okay, so um, my only portfolio is that I served on the redistricting committee along with Richard Hilliard here. And then I have worked a lot on a bunch of maps that uh, uh, would get some exposure to council about that. Um, I have, um, I, I can show you um, briefly what a plausible seven ward map would look like. I don't know how you'd get it on camera unless I got hooked into the... Uh, zoom thing we can kind of see that we can see uh, uh, it's i could i yeah i could i could mail it but it, it, uh, it let me just talk about this any seven ward map will require wards four and seven to expand downward because there's no other place for us to go up in the new north end and so one of those two wards probably ward four would have to expand into the old north end at least as far as north street and as far west as east as la fountain or all the way down to battery uh to the battery park and as far west as park as far east as park street and uh, that's probably the least objectionable and that uh, was seemed to be objectionable to folks from the old north end and uh, there's no way to avoid that with a seven ward map now the other consequence if we go to eight wards because ward one is one seven by the way if we did a seven ward map ward one is golden because you're one seventh of the city right now but if we go to an eight ward map then um ward one is big it's too big and so uh then things have to change a little bit now there is one way that you could keep most of the character of ward one and with an eight ward map and this is different than the um on this oh go ahead I gotta, um, 
you know, we're going to, we have a separate time oh, slot. Okay, then sort of go maybe I should let this go until then. And I think, you know, if you can email that. I will. We could, okay. we could show that. I'm, I'm happy to do discussion. that. And um, I, and that's only going to be in a few minutes. So, uh, but before we leave, speak out. Just one quick, Aaron, yeah. very, very quickly. I just wanted to correct a, perhaps a misimpression. Um, when I talked about a more equitable distribution of students, I did not mean uh, to have that sound like we don't want any students. Um, I came here as a student of UVM myself um, and honored the contribution <laughs> that they make. So just want to uh, correct that that potential uh, misimpression. Okay. Are there speak out issues on something other than redistricting? Because we're going to come back to redistricting in in about ten minutes, so it's it's going to be there. Um, Maya, did did you want to uh, say anything at this point? Observe and I'm just happy to join you tonight. And uh, for those who don't know, Maya is one of the candidates for. Um, City Council to uh, for the East District, and um, you'll. Yeah, I think you're going to be here next yeah. week. Yes, the, I'll be the, here next uh, week. Yep. Mm -hmm. The forum. Yes. Okay. Yeah, but I, I hear loud and clear that East District needs representation, and yep. I would like to step up and and help out with that, and represent okay. these opinions. So thank you, thank you, Tom, for the opportunity. Uh, we're going to move on, uh, at least temporarily, to the school commission update, which, Kathy, you got to be smiling after th that discussion. Come on. No, you got to get, Kathy, you got you to come up and come over here to get in the camera. What? I'm oh. making you come over here to be in the camera. Oh, to be in the You leave that there. We have a microphone for you. <laughs> oh, the, the camera scrolls to her. Wait, she she can she could have stayed. She just needs the microphone. <laughs> right here. And there's the camera. Oh okay. you're on candid camera here, you know. No, I just want to warmly thank all of you here and not here for everything everybody did because it was a heavy lift and you all chipped in, wrote letters stood out and honked and waved it, and went door to door some people it was it was really wonderful and well you see the 75.6 percent we couldn't have gotten a better answer to what we needed so thank you all very much and that's really all i have to say because that's all we've been working on so now the hard work of Continuing to fundraise, I mean, we have so far gotten $66,000 in without asking. That's people just stepping forward, giving to this that live in Burlington and really want to see a high school. And they knew they had the funds to be able to donate. But we will start asking in earlier on, uh, later on. <laughs> within the next couple of weeks. That's our next big thing besides writing large grants. And some of them have already been written and more will be written. Federal grants and state grants, we are going to organize and I'll probably be back asking you all to help because the Department of Ed has kind of pretty well answered a, a letter we have written to, asking for some of the 32 million that they have for the PCB re remediation. And they told us that it wasn't to be used for us. We're the only school in the state that has been closed down. There's one school, the I think their gym out in, oh God, I don't even remember the town. It's a small rural town and they're not getting it either. So I don't, I, I don't know what they're going to do with the 32 million. But we also need to go back to them about starting to give us everyone in the whole state, because this is just the tip of the iceberg. This is gonna continue. 
as they start testing schools. So there are, I think, you know, the possibility of millions and millions that are going to be needed to build new schools around the state. And the state needs to start putting back the 30% for building costs for schools across the state. Otherwise, I mean, all these schools, many of them, the reason is that they were built in the 60s and 70s, and that's across the whole state. So now they were all built with PCBs and they are gonna get tested. So yes, we still have a lot of work to be done. I don't wanna say that, but I'm very, very happy about what happened here. And I thank you all for helping with that. So thanks. Before you go, before you go, oh. any, any questions? No. Any. Oh, it's all right. Yeah, which is just, well, one, just to thank you to Kathy for so many years working so hard to advocate for students and especially on this issue. I know it's been a lot. And then just a question around the, I don't know how much you can talk about it and if it's been more discussed in executive session or something like that, but the lawsuit and if, like how likely that feels and um, what the timeline for that is. You know what, it, it, <laughs> It, I think it was being next, this week or next week, it is going to be um, surfed or whatever you say when you- Can you tell us lawsuit. what the lawsuit is? Oh, it's, a, it's, it's against Monsanto. Oh, that, that lawsuit. Yes, to, oh. to help with the remediation costs of, okay. of this. And so, All right. yes. But I don't know because I haven't even seen the, the the writing of it because they they were writing it the the lawyers and stuff. So, I mean, there's also a lawsuit from teachers that worked for years at BHS, and I think there's three of them right now that are together suing Monsanto as well. So, any other questions? No, I've I do have one other question. Okay. Though. The the fundraising effort, what's the goal? How much how much money are you trying to raise? As much as we can get. <laughs> Did you, five million. Do you have a friend in LA that just won a lottery? No, but we have very generous people okay. within within Burlington. And also we're going to look at it. We also have a lot of people. They graduated from BHS and left Burlington and live okay. elsewhere, and we're hoping they will too be willing. So we to... talk, we're talking about tens of millions that you want to to raise. Well, that would be very nice, but we really haven't sat down and set a, a amount. We just coordinated with the Burlington Students Foundation that we had a five hundred one c three to go with, and now and we we needed to really pass the bond to even start that because okay. we couldn't we couldn't write a lot of the grants unless we had a bond because they're asking is the is the community committed and the building? bond shows that it is yes okay so that's kind of and we're hoping that we don't use all 165 million of that but okay okay thank you all right oh. Oh. Go ahead, Angie. Yes, um, I just want to thank Kathy, my neighbor, um, personally, but also <laughs> also as a representative of our neighborhood for how much time and effort she has put into not just this bond issue, but for years and years and years, she's represented our neighborhood in the interests of families and children all over the city. Um, working for education. And she has been a great contributor to what has happened and what happens and how it is our children get educated in the city. So I just want to commend Kathy for all of her years and thank her for what she does because it's really, really important what you do. Thank you. Thank you. No. no. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. So we are uh, returning to redistricting. Do we have a 
um, a map that you can show? Yeah. Many maps. <laughs> So, um, before we do that, Zaria, did you want to say something to, to initiate this conversation, or should we just continue as? Uh, yeah, so maybe just to let Robert know that we have had this conversation in NPA. So, I think most folks are kind of oriented on. No, no, you haven't. You haven't seen any of these maps. So sorry, sorry, we had the conversation about like seven ward and what that does and things like that. And then I'm I'm happy to have Robert go first if he wants, and then I can show folks if they haven't seen the six maps that the council considered yesterday. Um, so kind of like what the council is looking at right now. Because again, I feel like that there's a, and then I think I, I, I think the goal should be per Earhart's suggestion to have some kind of like, please don't, please don't do this this map version. Yeah, could we, could we go through those six maps? Could we, could we start with, could we, could we start with what the city council is looking at? Okay, we're yeah. gonna start with yeah. your maps, Zora. Great, do you want me to share or are you all able to share over there? There, There's the North Hill version one, version two, and then they have a longer title. It says uh, main campus and some Champlain. Great. Right. So if you, yeah, if you, right. perfect. So if you can link down on that first eyeball, that little left thing, just so I can talk through. Yeah. So folks can see that at the same time. Great. So yeah. at the beginning of the, <laughs> um, the last two, sorry, the last two, the last two maps were added kind of late. Um, and we're going to start with the first two. So the first two are the maps that I said, so Karen, the, everybody knew going into the meetings that I supported the Central Hill version of one and two. So if we can look at those first. Yeah, and you'll have to unclick the North Hill version one so that we can see that. Okay, so that kind of accommodates the growth of Ward one by removing that section that's closer to downtown. This is the one that stays somewhat close to what we what we have right now, um, which is an ideal either. So I can understand folks critiques of that. So it mostly cuts out that university section right there that we see that has 807 folks. And then that downtown section that has 27 and 137. Um, then do you wanna go to Central Hill version two? Um, I think this keeps a little bit more of the map is as you can see, I think this one was a little bit politically infeasible for folks because especially the South District Councilors really want Ward 1 to take some part of campus. So this Ward 8 to Central Hill version 2, I think folks didn't like so much because Ward 1 doesn't take anything across from Main Street, um, but has a similar, I think, as you can see, feel. So those were the two that keep Ward 1 the most in place. And then if you go to North Hill, So this is what Ward 8 has been pushing. Our current folks in Ward 8 um, have been pushing a lot. So mm -hmm. there's been a lot of emails that we've been getting, especially from people in current Ward 8 who don't like the Central Hill sections. So they've been very vocal um, about removing the Central Hill sections and having some version of the North Hill. Um, this so this is a this was based on a map that was created by one of the mapping groups i think mostly barbara barbara hedrick i think um and if you so what this does is a, to some extent the compromise maybe here is is that it does create an old it keeps old east and somewhat together and that if we go back to ward 1 and ward 8 the whole the district becomes the old east end with a little bit added both across from Main Street and on the west side. But like folks have been saying, it fairly strongly um, removes most of the single family home block from Ward 1, which would make it very strongly student. And so Karen keeps saying, oh, but the student population of this is actually still lower than Ward 6. Um, because they're only looking at on-campus students because those are the ones that they can most easily count. 
Um, but because of previous studies that we've done, which Sharon has pointed to, um, we know that Ward 1 has a lot of on-campus students. So there is some concern with Ward 1 becoming, having lo like even lower voter turnout kind of as we lose some of our more stable voting block and losing some, to Peter's point, some of that like state, like folks who really have been stepping up and doing a lot of the school board running for office, things like that. And that's very similar if we go to Ward 8 North Hill version 2, which I think the difference in that is like what block they add to, um, what block of athletic campus we get so across from Main Street. Um, but other than that, it's very similar. And then I didn't, so this is maybe where I looked at Earhart and Sharon because I didn't finish watching the recording. So I don't know how folks felt about Ward 8 to downtown and Ward 8 with UVM main campus and some Champlain. Karen, again, Karen and Ben heard from me before the meeting that this configuration of the map didn't work for me. I haven't touched base with them yet because I wanted to talk to the NPA first um, before I loop back with them. But if we go to Ward 8 to downtown, This was discussed, but it's not one of the ones that they moved forward. I said that I couldn't accept this. I think it really doesn't preserve the old East End. Um, I'll leave it there. I just said that I, but this was another version. And then I think, I know that the South End Counselor's favorite map is that last one. So Ward 8 with UVM main campus and some Champlain. And that's what that looks like. And I feel like this looks like the most gerrymandered map in that it has the least continuous, um, the least continuous words. I think it does a lot of appendages. Um, and I think I'll leave it at that because I don't think that these maps were supported by the council during that conversation either. Zariah, can I respond or, or um, may Please, I respond yes. to Zariah? Uh, um, as I recall, um, you know, these these maps were <laughs> awful when I looked at them. Um, and so there was some um, shock value here, but um, the comments that I recall, not only were the, the communications that were sent from current members of Ward 8 uh, considered, but there is, as Robert Bristow Johnson knows, um, there, I can't remember Chris's last name, but there's a strong desire to have a downtown district. And I believe that some of these scenarios that you were showing car cuts that, you know, carves that up a bit. And so the um, North Hill uh, makes it more contiguous and keeps that downtown district more intact. And so I think that was a factor that was being considered also. Uh, Erhard, I'll look to Erhard to see what he recalls. Erhard? Uh, sorry. Um, can you repeat that question? I'm sorry, I was trying to write up the motion that I was going to propose in a bit. <laughs> Sharon? Oh, you want me to? Oh, so well, Zariah raised the question. You know, she said she wasn't, she wanted to know what we had heard um, from the council as they discussed these other options that she just presented. And my point was that I thought that besides the communications from the uh, current Ward 8 uh, long-term residents, there was um, a desire by uh, some, Robert Bristow Johnson and Chris, whatever his last name is, sorry, I don't remember, um, to have a more contiguous and intact downtown district. And I don't think these uh, really achieved that as well as some of the, uh, of some of the earlier versions. Uh, yeah, certainly not. Um, I mean, I, I would say that the ones that do, you know, the ones, the one that folks are looking at right now, and the ones uh, entitled um, Ward 8 to North Hill, 
uh, version one and two are the ones that do absolutely the most, uh, you know, the most damage to uh, the traditional integrity of of, of Ward um, Ward one. And if um, you know we're going to express uh, our displeasure with uh, specific maps, I would uh, I would include those. Well, the other and thing is, Zariah, the other thing is that, as you pointed out, some the map that we're looking at right now, I mean, it, it it's um, it's one might ask what made somebody just there seems to be very this is more gerrymandered than others i would say you know i i'm just i'm just pointing that out that um i wonder what the rationale is for this it seems like there is a political rationale not a uh redistricting uh one voice one vote kind of rationale yeah, and the last thing that I'll add as we go into the discussion is I don't think, I guess in terms of what we can ask for, I don't think there's, not saying that there's not Ward 7 maps that I think make a lot of sense because I think there is. I don't think that it's going to be politically feasible to bring back a 7 Ward map and ask the council to reconsider it. So my suggestion would be that as we talk that <laughs> um, unless we think there is the reason that other folks think that there is something we can convince counselors of, um, but based on the last city council vote, I really don't think there is. So I, my suggestion would be to suggest eight ward maps, even understanding that we may think a seven ward by seven by two system is the best. I think the seven ward map is dead in the water. I think that, you know, there was real agreement um, that it's going to be eight wards and four districts. And that was, that's what I heard from both redistricting work sessions. Sandy, you've got, uh, you want to join? James, can you hear me okay? You're a little, we can't hear you very well. How's this? Is that better? Yes. Um, Zariah, could you just refresh my memory? Is it the entire city council must vote uh, um, to agree, or is it like just a majority vote? That was question number one. Question number two, um, is there any consideration of the students that are going to be, the buildings that are going to be put on Trinity which will clearly increase the number of students on that campus. And three, just a point of uh, comment, I really find it outrageous that they're not considering the off-campus student population. I'll uh, take my answers offline here. Great, so it's a majority, which at this point is six counselors. Um, I have brought up Trinity and the off-campus student population um, and that, so it's like, it's been part of the discussions, but um, I just don't, I, I think, I think just me saying something um, at this point, I, I think we should include that in the resolution that Earhart's drafting up. And the, the one other thing on that is most of the map deviations, a few of these are nine just under 9% and a few of these are butting up right against the 10% deviation that's kind of allowable. Um, so it does make it hard, even if we wanna consider the Trinity campus is how much we can have this map, even just because the census blocks are so big and the only place we can really break up census blocks during the student dorms, because we know how many students are in each building. Um, so we've talked about some things like, oh, do we survey each block to try to have things be smaller? But um, it can be a little hard to increase the deviation more than we have for any of the maps, just because of how small, like 68 people, you know, is like 0.7% of a deviation already. Sorry if that was a little technical. I hope that that tracked. Soraya, um, I think that I learned that because Trinity hasn't been built yet, you have to deal with the current noses on the ground. You can't put in anticipated development, even though I totally agree with everything, but you can't do that because it may not happen. So you have to deal with current population 
And exactly. I, think it's, so you can, I think it's really unfortunate that we can't do the Trinity piece. Exactly. So we can anticipate it by saying, oh, we should, in terms of arguments for on-campus versus off-campus off population, but in terms of drawing the actual maps and having the exact numbers, we can't have that deviation because it would be so large, if that makes sense. So, Zariah, um, if you could just, what what are your thoughts on uh, Central Hill version one? Because that gets us living and learning, which has got to be close to the other athletic campus options. But it also preserves Brooks, Loomis, Henry, th that whole, what, what have you heard people, what have you heard resp in response to that Central Hill version one? Yeah, so I think that, um, so I think what, what was said in the council meeting, I'm going to say what was said, and then I'm going to say what I think is happening, which I think is two different things is um, one, so I think folks are saying this looks too close to the current to the status quo. Um, so I think some folks like it for that reason, which is like, if we're not shaking it up and going to seven wards, or we're not shaking it up and going to something drastically different, then isn't it just fair to stay like somewhat close? I think folks are concerned this doesn't do enough of a downtown because folks are like, oh, it's too far north. And then, you know, the eight is still a little bit gerrymandered, not nearly as much as it was. Um, but no, I think that, I think both, I think the central hill map options are just, I think they're better options. And I think they, I don't think they actually, I mean, if you look at the last map, I think this looks much more continuous. All of the patches of wards look much more continuous to me than some of the other ones. I like, I am I said I was okay with both of the central hill versions. You want to hear from me? Other comments? Oh, sorry. One more thing. And then I think what is actually happening, why folks don't like it, is Ward 6 is still taking on such a significant portion of the of the student population. So they're still taking on at least that 1,374 block that you see kind of at the like two numbers above Ward 6, I think is one of the issues. I'm not sure what the others are. Would they consider adding more of uh, athletic campus onto that version one Central Hill? So Harris Mellis, Marsh House and Tupper. I'm not familiar enough with UVM to understand the question. <laughs> so that so I'm looking at Central Hill version one and it's got that little little jut that crosses Main Street and includes living and learning, but it doesn't include the other residence halls right there. So none of the University Heights no Marsh Austin Topper, no Harris Mellis, and, right? Those are all like, if they want, if, if their worry is that we're not taking on enough students, why not just take all of athletic campus? Into ward one. Yeah. yeah. Because then we have to cut. So that, right. then, so the then, question starts then I'm looking at like the St. Joseph's seminary cemetery corner, cut something out of there and give it to ward two. I don't, I don't know. I, I, you know, this is population. really, yeah, I know. Yeah. Yeah, that's 14 people. <laughs> Is that St. <Saint laughs> Joseph Cemetery Corner? So yeah, no, I think that was some of the early that's that was some of the early maps is where gotcha. Ward One dug much more into it, but that's when we lose the hill section. Because you can't cut from us from the east. We can't cut from the north. We, right. It's like we're because we're bounded by the limits of the city, the really only place we can cut is from the west. All right, Jonathan. Really quick question for you, Zariah. If you were to pick one of these to advocate for right now, and this is before you talk, which one would it be? Thank you. Oh, I'm, I mean, I don't, I think it doesn't any of the, I would say Central Hill version one, just because I think it gives us a little bit more of athletic campus. So it's a little bit more politically feasible. So Central Hill version one. All right, you've oh. got some maps. All They're right, moving. yeah, there's some maps and he might have, um, I'm just going to the board docs maps and uh, we should probably, um, um, if you'd go to the ones that uh, are uh, V14, uh, V15, 
and V18. Um, these were, um, yeah, one, one, of the, one of those. So uh, uh, I was just the mathematical reality of it is that ward one does have to downsize something in an eight ward map because you're one seventh of the city and not one eighth of the city. Now it turns out that's the Hill Gardens block that's between Willard and Williams would be enough to do that. Um, but um, the way that you'd have to strip that off and also to take some of the student population away from Ward 6, um, the maps that you looked at, the Central Hill maps that had the Ward 8 that looks like Massachusetts with Cape Cod coming down, um, that was one way to do it. But the reason that was rejected is it's too much like the, the current Salamander Ward for which is the badge of shame I get to wear because I'm the person who drew that. Nonetheless, a way to do that is to strip off instead the Redstone campus into a, a ward that would include all of Champlain College. There's another one, the V18 map, and they both look like Texas. Uh, uh, um, and it would be a way to preserve the shape of Ward 1 almost exactly as it is now. But here's the problem. Even though that's not a salamander that looks like Texas, it is still exists for only one purpose, and that's to dump the, our, redistricting, our redistricting problems into. And if you're a permanent resident in that, in that ward, how are you going to feel about that? It'd be about the same as how people in Buell Bradley are feeling now about Ward 8. Um, and that was the big mistake we made. It was nine years ago. Ward 8 is leftovers. Ward 8 exists because the rest of the city got to be 82% of the city got to stay in the same ward and vote in the same place. And then we just swept everything under the rug in the present ward eight. And so we can't repeat that mistake, even if it's not a salamander shaped ward. Now, what I'm trying to tell council and what I did get to tell council after this work session, which was not as effective, is that if you don't want to repeat the same mistake, you're going to want want to give Ward 8 an identity. You, you don't want to create a neighborhood out of nothing and call that Ward 8. You want to give it an identity. And there is a part of the city that does want to be a ward and that has identity, and that's downtown. And um, I did supply to city council, and I did get on the board, Doc. So if you want to go to the V20 map, this is before um, Nancy um, Stetton V20. Yes. If you want to blow that up a little bit. Um, so uh, um, that is after talking with Sharon Bushore and getting an earful from her, which was good for me, that we did some um, changes so that part more of Ward 1 gets to be preserved in Ward 1. All of the part between North Street and Pearl and west of Willard remains in Ward 1. This is Henry and Loomis and Brooks gets to remain in Ward 1. But you still have to lose something. The downtown ward gets all of Champlain College. None of that goes into Ward 6 or any other ward. And it gets some of the Buell, Bradley, and it gets some other student, but it's not doesn't get a lot of the students. Ward 6 still gets all of the athletic campus except for living learning and the Redstone campus. And that would be a, a burden that is, will take some persuasion to convince uh, Ward 6 to, to accept that because they want Ward 1 to take the entire athletic campus. And, and if you take the entire athletic campus, it's like a water balloon. Then Ward 1 will have to deflate on the other side, on the, on the Willard Street side. And you're gonna lose all of tech, uh, all, lose all of, uh, uh, um, of, uh, 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 the, the Loomis and, and, and Henry and, and Brooks. And so I, I just want to let you know, got folks know who your friends are. That is a plausible map that will preserve as much of Ward 1 as you're going to get. It gives us a downtown ward and they want to have identity. It puts the Buell Bradley folks back into Ward 2 where they were 10 years ago. It puts the Hill Gardens back into Ward 2, where they were 10 years ago. And so I am suggesting to you folks, 
if you were to preserve Ward 1, you might want to get behind that. <clears throat> And Robert, do you know the breakdown of the on-campus? Pardon me? Do you by any chance know the breakdown of the on-campus? At least what, Oh, uh, Ward 1 would have approximately 50, 55%. Unfortunately, Ward 6 will get 67% on-campus students. That's where, that's where the trouble is. But they don't have any of Champlain College. Uh, uh, in Ward 6. And that was, the, if you're going to have a downtown Ward 8, it can reach that far east, but it can't reach far enough east to take a piece of the UVM student housing. So you, mm -hmm. you in order to- I know that Karen's goal is to keep all of the wards below 50% or at 50% on campus students. So I'm- I'm happy to inter like talk to any map about her, but I feel like she's going to have a hard time, and therefore the Democratic caucus is going to have a hard time supporting a map that keeps Ward 6 at 67%. How much of the athletic campus here is it's only living learning? So can you split the difference? Can you speak louder? I can't hear you. Can we split the difference between Marsh, Austin, Tupper, and Aaron Lewis then? Well, you could ask add Marsh Austin on Austin Tupper, but it will still then deflate part of the other side of Ward right, One. And we just don't know where to go. Yeah. yeah. Earhart. So Robert had shared this map with me um uh earlier and I, I think this map holds promise. Um I think it with some adjustments um that can't really be made here because um <laughs> when you if, if you've ever worked with the software that Robert's working with, which I, I have as well, and you start pushing uh, streets around and pushing blocks around, it's you, you can't sitting here right now, you can't see what the repercussions of that are going to be. Um, so I think the most that we can do tonight is express a general favorability for certain maps that we find more um, more acceptable um, with a caveat that they're uh, they may need uh, they may require additional adjustment um, unless you know folks are willing to accept this as is right now. Um, I, I don't know if folks are ready to hear a potential motion before you do the, the motion. Um... Sure. I, I wanted to entertain other uh, questions, Richard, or comments. I don't have any. I'll go back to your air hunt. Yeah, I don't have any questions. But as Robert mentioned, I was the representative or delegate voted or appointed by the NPA um, to represent Ward One on the redistricting committee. Uh, and uh, just a couple of points. Um, almost half of the total uh, comments made from the public listening that we were chartered to do were from Ward 1. Ward 1 was more engaged than any other ward. Um, so that speaks to what Sharon said, what, what Peter said, um, what Earhart has said. Ward 1 is engaged. Um, the work of the committee which incidentally didn't include the notion of a downtown ward, um, was completely subverted by the city. Uh, one of the, uh, the lowlights of it is that one of the, the most biggest areas of concern was representation of the people and of the neighborhoods uh, within the wards, even, even uh, city councillors said that the ward, the district configurations are too big uh, and are unmanageable. And we have seen that exemplified by um, Jane Stromberg, Ali House, Jack Hansen, and almost, uh, thank goodness not, but almost Zariah uh, abandoning ship. Um, I don't have a great solution, but I just want to tell you that the the Ward 1's input was very, very strong, was represented strongly, but then subverted by 
um, map drawers, Robert is one, but he's not, I, I'm not blaming Robert, but um, the Barbara Hedricks, uh, Chris Hazley's of this world, and some um, gymnasts in the North, New North End, um, completely subverted all the public comment that had been presented. Uh, and I will leave it at that. All right, thanks. Um, one more thing that I want to add, just because I think there were maps early, and then I think people removed them in case because they thought I might get offended. But there is also a version, like there's a version that cuts away from Ward One on Riverside Ave, um, and I think maybe that was one of the first things that you saw that the that the mapping group saw. But I just want I feel like none of the things that we've seen here. But I just want to say that as we're doing trade-offs, if we want to keep all of the hill section, one way to do that is to move Riverside into the old North End. All right. Um, Erhard, you wanted to make a motion. Yeah. So I... Uh, <clears throat> I have a, a draft motion um, here um, and happy to read it. Um, I'm hoping that it uh, represents what I'm hearing as the potential consensus of, uh, of uh, the ward. So the motion is um, as reads as follows. Um, the Ward 1 NPA supports redistricting maps that maintain Ward 1's historic boundaries and neighborhood integrity to the maximum extent possible. We specifically reject the following maps being considered by the City Council. Ward 8 to Downtown, Ward 8 to North Hill, V1 and V2, Ward 8 with UVM Main Campus and some Champlain. Though they require additional work, to meet its goal of maintaining historic boundaries, the Ward 1 NPA favors the maps entitled Ward 8 to Central Hill, V1 and V2, as well as Robert Bristow Johnson's map entitled Burlington 8 Wards, V20. We got a motion on the floor. Uh, we have a second. Uh, discussion? Anybody online? Carter. Oh, Carter. Um, well, and I know with the with the two uh, Central Hill right maps, people were people mentioned that it looked too much like the current configuration. But it looks like, um, and others can remind me if I'm wrong, but I feel like one of the big complaints about Ward Eight was that there wasn't enough uh homeowners or like longer term residents and it feels like it cuts into past pearl past colchester into um towards the old north end to sort of grow that population in addition to renters um but maybe i'm not looking at that right but i feel like i don't know i just want to express my support for those two because it feels like it sort of gets at at least some of the challenge that it has been brought up around ward eight the central hill yeah 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 I mean, that's why I put in the motion the kind of caveat, you know, though they require additional work, <laughs> because I don't think we can design the perfect thing here. Somebody with the map software needs to do that. I think this is an expression of intent. Uh, excuse me, Carter, you're saying that this resolves some of the concern that today's Ward 8 people have? I think so. Yeah. Okay. I just want to make sure I heard right. Sorry if I misunderstood. No, I. I think we're saying the same thing. Um, other comments? All right, I think we lose Sharon. Um, yes, I'm sorry. I just wanted to say that I think that um, the proposal reflects the diversity that I think Carter and everybody is really looking for. I think it really is important that 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 Zariah uh, share with the rest of the council that Ward One isn't student phobic by any means, but we need a healthy mix of people and we need long-term uh, owner-occupied uh, properties and we need professionals and we need <coughs> students. 
Um, and we are diverse and that diversity works for us. And I think we've been able to be successful in tackling problems because of that diversity. And to lose that um, has great significance. So anyways, I support the motion on the floor. Thank you. All right, I'm gonna uh, bring the motion to a vote. So, oh, sorry, did you wanna make a comment? Oh, I've talked enough. You've heard from me enough. All right. Um, so we have a motion. It's been seconded. And for people who are residents of Ward no, 1. I'm not a member of Ward 1, so I don't vote. Um, all in favor, say aye. Aye. Uh, aye. Opposed? Abstained? The motion carries. And uh, Earhart, you're going to make sure that Carol gets a copy of what you've written. OK, Carter. Well, and can I just make one suggestion that maybe we send someone from the MPA officially to public comment and that we all show up as active MPA members to at the next city council meeting at the next city council meeting to that reiterate the Monday. I believe so, right, Sarah? I think it's Board of Finance. I want to say is next week. So it's the twenty second or the twenty first, whatever that month. Yeah, is. I feel like it's two weeks. Yeah, because okay. I, I think it'll hold more weight if if twenty folks are showing up to reiterate the point. So this is a Board of Finance meeting on November twenty first. All right, I'm getting confused. What City Council? Sorry, I think the 14th is city council and I'll look it up right now to make sure, but I think 14th is board of finance, 20 something is city council. 21st is city council. Thank you. Go ahead and get her. Oh yeah, where is it? Oh, I'm sorry. So we got Thanks. Um, so thank you uh, everyone for um, this, this is, I know, a, a difficult discussion, and it's not, um, it's it's wonky and, and detailed, uh, but I really appreciate everybody's support. Um, it would truly be great if folks show up um, at that meeting. The public forum is time certain, 7.30. Um, you can uh, Zoom in, um, but, you know, in person is probably better, but you can also Zoom in and testify um, over, over Zoom. Um, the best for folks who haven't done it before, the best is to uh, actually register online. Um, the, the, there's a form uh, online to, to fill out, to register that um, you want to be part of public comment. You get two minutes and um, you get cut off summarily if you go um, more than a couple of seconds beyond that. Uh, so just, and then the only other thing I'll say is um, this does not take away from um, you know, the action that we took tonight and people showing up at, uh, uh, at the meeting on the 21st doesn't take away from uh, the notion of sending some emails, uh, also sending some emails in support of, uh, and, and making whatever points you want, um, uh, you know, that have been made, uh, I think, quite articulately by a lot of folks uh, this evening, um, in support of uh, either this motion, uh, or, you know, your own, your own solution, you know, asking for um, the the respect of the integrity of Ward 1. Thanks, Earhart. And if I can add to that from Earhart, I think it's very important for folks to send the emails as well as public forum, because public <laughs> forum honestly can sometimes be too late in terms of folks changing their mind. And so if folks can send the emails in the next couple of days. I think that'll give me a little bit more leverage when I go talk to Ben and Karen um, to, to try to get to some... Okay. Just, okay. Go ahead. Yeah. You're up. Um, I have a quick question, and that is how should we, in our letters to counselors, how should we reference this motion? Um, Carol, I assume that we'll put it on the NPA website, and then folks can just write on the NPA agenda website as a supporting material. Is that true? You can do that. Okay. And we could do probably do that soon, like tomorrow. And counselors will know it's there too to find it. If you're sending an email, just say it as proposed or as stated in this and put a link to it. Thank you. If anybody wants a copy, um, Cheryl, I'll send you copies. 
I just want to quickly thank you, Zariah, for being in the room. I have every bit of faith and trust in you. So thank you for being in there and doing that work. Thank you, Troy. And and because I'm a little bit confused, the we're talking about a city council meeting on what date? Monday the 21st. Monday the 21st. Okay. At 7. 7.30 is the uh, public comment time. Okay. All right. Thank you. Can you have that uh, list of emails? Yes. Yes, we have that. And for those who uh, came late or did not register, we do have a clipboard out in the lobby. And if you could add your name and email, that would help. We're going to uh, move on to um, a public safety overview. And Mila Grant is here again. And uh, I think you have some slides you're going to show. I think we have some slides. Okay. <clears throat> I got us all set to go. Um, is that the slide? That is the slide. Okay. Thank you. So I was. I was asked to uh, speak about a couple of things um, to review in more detail, a little bit more detail about the uh, priority response plan and also to give a little bit more information about what the police commission does. And admittedly, that's really been evolving the last two years. Um, the revised a priority response plan, which we had previously talked about, was a way to take a look at incidents. Um, so when you look at this document, as a reminder, it is included uh, with each of the monthly chief's reports. And it takes a look at the various types of incidents, and it assigns them a priority from one to three. Priority one incidents are the incidents that are considered the most dangerous, um, where there's what uh, is referred to as a life safety component. So the priority one incidents are always going to have a sworn officer respond first. We have these two other positions that um, we've heard a lot about and have had budgetary increases to support more of those positions. And that is the uh, CSOs, the community service officers, and the CSLs, the community support liaisons. Now the community service officers, they are able to report to um, certain types of incidents that are not priority one incidents. So they will never be sent on their own or first to a priority one incident. It is possible because some of the work that they do is a little bit more proactive. Some of you might've seen some of the CSOs walking around downtown that they might come upon something that they then report is a priority one incident and request um, a public service, a, a police officer, a sworn officer. Um, so they're simply just things that they can't do because they're not sworn officers. The community support liaisons, these are the work done by um, social workers. And then um, mm -hmm. there's the Howard Center support team, which I actually want to detour to for a little bit. Uh, between the Howard Center support team and the community support liaison, they deal with issues that once it's deemed safe, involve a component of assisting people who might not have the stability in life that they need. Uh, they might be homeless. They might be uh, have mental health issues. They might have drug addiction is issues, which as we talked about last time can create that instability. Um, so they're there to do a certain type of response meant to um, get people to services if at all possible. Um, and a big part of their job is to get to know people, get to know people um, on the street, get to interact with them 
and uh, whenever possible, try to be proactive in terms of preventing some of the crises that uh, occur, um, or at least be there to, to de-escalate them. So uh, going back to the first slide, please. So when we look at these, um, you'll see highlighted the CSOs. So when you look at this page at your leisure, you can see exactly what type of incidents CSOs will be sent to. And then um, there'll be some indications for CSLs as well as, and also things that people should really be reporting online. Um, this type of plan is meant to be what they uh, refer to as a deployment plan, how resources are deployed during the, um, the various shifts. So uh, sometimes people have questions about, is something really an incident, uh, a priority one? For example, if there's a 911 hang up, well, you don't know why there was a 911 hang up. It was someone calling for help and then suddenly was stopped from calling for help. You have to send an officer to find out exactly what's going on in order to determine. So something could start as a priority one, be changed to something later. Uh, once they get there and determine what it is, something could start as a priority two or three and be raised to a priority one. So uh, definitely situations evolve uh, for sure. Um, going down to the next two slides that had the different officers. Uh, no, you can actually, we're not going to do the whole report today, but as a reminder, the monthly report has the uh, year-to-date incidents, and then on the next page, uh, continues to track selected Valcor incidents, um, and these incidents in particular are selected because they're priority one. Um, and going down, going down, 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 there, tiers of response. So, um, these tiers of response was a slide that the chief added just to give a little bit more um, of a view in terms of uh, patrol. Proactive patrol is the key to public safety. Uh, we'd like to see more proactive patrols. CSOs perform some of those uh, functions, but um, we're not going to have the level of, of proactivity until we are able to get our numbers back up. Um, detectives taking cases that are referred to patrol uh, because those type of cases require a lot more time, investigation, and resources. The emergency response unit has special equipment uh, training to tackle crisis incidents like barricaded persons, active shooters, and high-risk warrants. The street outreach team, um, the Howard Center street out outreach team answers calls for service, but tries to do as much work as they can proactively. And if you um, are walking in the downtown area, in addition to seeing CSOs, you will see members of the outreach team. And they're there starting early in the morning throughout the day, interacting people, checking in with people. Um, we had at our last meeting, our October meeting, a presentation from Tammy Buddha from the uh, Howard Center. It is really mandatory viewing. I really appreciated um, her frankness and her feedback. We originally wanted a presentation about de-escalation because that was something that we were concerned about. Um, de-escalation de uh, tactics that could be used. And she gave that and was excellent. She then we kind of asked some other questions that really led to a deep diving of what their job is out there. And it is very interesting in terms of having a view of exactly what they're dealing with and how the environment for them is changing. So I know there's been a lot of um, emphasis on gunshots, the gunfire incidents, because, of course, those are scary. But there's other types of violence. There's other types of threats that occur. And our street outreach team is, they're seeing threats with uh, knives, screwdrivers, other shop objects to the point where they're now asking for vest. Um, an additional 
having additional officers would be helpful to them because they are now finding a new element coming into our downtown, an element of people coming into the community to prey on individuals that are dealing especially with addiction. Because although uh, some of these individuals may be homeless, they may be receiving certain benefits or have access to certain monies that that make them a target. And so uh, Tammy talked about how that was affecting, I believe she referred to it as social currency because part of their job is really to get to know everyone. And if you're going into a, a situation, everybody knows that you're there to help them, then they're gonna have love for you, right? They're gonna watch out for you. But with this new element causing a threat, that's causing some other people to leave. So you're losing that social currency. I found her to be very interesting, very engaging. Um, and I think when people listen to her, they have an understanding of the type of, excuse me, the type of work that they're doing and the importance of it. Because one of the things that really distresses me is when people say, oh, you can't send a social worker to be a police officer's job. Uh, we don't need social workers. We need, a, a comprehensive, holistic public safety system that includes these positions. And yes, we are now seeing more incidents where um, before officers could just be released. Yes, it's going to be a safe situation. Social worker can handle it. Our officers can go work on other things. And um, now we're seeing this increased level of danger. So I highly recommend it. Tammy Buddha, the last um, meeting for the uh, police commission, town meeting TV, as always records it, happy to send the link. Um, and I'm also going to be asking that on our board docs page that we start to put the links to our meetings. I think that would be really helpful. So please look out for those. Now we have a staff member. Yes. In our budget. So it's been great to say, Hey, can we do this? Can you do this? Because we are between our full-time jobs and, uh, regular meetings and executive sessions. Um, we're kind of tapped out. Um, what does the police commission do? Well, actually, does anyone have any uh, questions about those two slides more in depth than um, number? How many CSOs and CSLs are actually in the city? That's a very good question. Uh, currently, um, as of our last meeting, there were seven CSOs and three CSLs. The budget for both positions has been um increased. So they're hoping by summer of 2023, we can get up to 12 CSOs and six CSLs. I personally would like more CSLs because I um, want to see more coverage through the day. We really need people to be uh, more available in the evenings. Um, and as you all know, sometimes the weekends is it can be a really big time where um, a lot of different types of incidents where they could be helpful could occur. I have a question also about the CS. Oh, I'm sorry. I asked about CSOs and CSLs. Ls. Yes. <clears throat> I myself worked as a street worker, it, but in Europe, in Germany for, I don't know, four or five years back in my younger days with kids that were, you know, in trouble or, or known to the police. Mm -hmm. But we were a separate, you know, agency that worked on them. And I really worry when I see this, that both the outreach, well, I guess they're working for Howard Center, right? They're working for Howard Center, but they can sometimes be called by the department for assistance. Okay. And the CSLs, are working for the police, right? They, I mean, they are, are part of the police's personnel. Right. They're in that budget. They're in the department. And I have to tell you, I used to be really strongly against that. That used to bug the heck out of me. Um, we had a presentation from Lacey Smith who talked about what her day-to-day -day was, the type of work that she did. Um, yes, they have like an office space. But the, when they're out there doing their job, they're out there doing their job. They're not in the department. They also need 
resources in the department to assist them with um, when you get certain types of calls, you have to evaluate what, what the safety situation is. And they have access to that information in the department. And in some cases, they do have to go out with an officer in order to determine if something's safe. They Certain situations, they would not be able to go out on their own. Okay. But I had a comfort that they were independent in terms of making um, decisions related to what they do best. Does that make sense? I it guess. does, but in the end, mm -hmm. they are under the police chief. They are not under <clears throat> another entity. And I see that as problematic also from how they're working with the population. I mean, the homeless population isn't dumb. They understand that they're part of the police force. And I personally, just from a social work standpoint, well, find that they're not sworn officers. No. Um, uh -huh. so, th so they can't do some of the same things that sworn officers can do in terms of like arrest people and things like that. I know. And I did when um, Lacey Smith gave her presentation and uh, was very open to responding to questions. It, it gave me the comfort level that they are independent. They are able to make judgment calls and that this was indeed a situation that acting chief Murad respects. He respects that position. He respects the work that they do. Um, and I do see that. And anyone who watches our meetings knows I don't always agree with him, but he he respects that work that they're doing. And so I I don't I I do understand why people get concerned about them being in the station. But it, it's not like they see people in the station. They go to where their clients are. They go to where the calls are. No, I I don't. I mean, I I it, it really bothers me that they are part of the police. They could be city and they could mm -hmm. sit in, you know, downtown in, in an office or in city hall, but to be part of the police, mm -hmm. I understand just from what the you're work saying. I've done, I, I, I understand what you're saying. Um, it, it's part of the, you know, it's part of dispatch too. Um, dispatch taking calls and making determinations of, what the best option is uh, based on the information that they're given. And that's what keeps them part of that. But I, I respect your concern. I understand it. Um, you are certainly not alone in that concern. And um, that was a, a, it was one of the reasons we asked uh, to have Lacey come to the police commission when she did, because we, we had those questions and wanted that that comfort level of of who's directing their work and what they're doing and and how much independence do they have and and the fact that they're like okay there's an office we come in we check in but if we need the resources there but then once our caseloads you know they all have very full caseloads and so trying to be proactive with those people as well as responding to calls for service. Yeah. Um, I, I talked with, um, Milo in preparation for this meeting, um, and, uh, for an hour and she has so much information. Um, and one of the things that the reasons that we wanted Milo to come back was that a lot of us in our neighborhoods are really struggling with the impact of, um, crimes that are happening. Um, and I think one of the things I just wanted to be sure that Milo touched on was just how, how can we take care of ourselves in terms of just making, um, more wise decisions about, um, our cars, our houses, et cetera. Before you move on to the uh, police commission, I just wanted- Sure. Because you see all of these incidents and you're seeing patterns that if, if, the, if the neighbors knew more about what to do more effectively, a lot of that crime would not be happening. I can definitely address that. Did you have a question, Carter, about what was- Well, yeah, no, I just, just going off Kathy's point. So if I'm 
tell me if this is, if I'm hearing you right, I guess, is that although the CSLs and like the street out uh, and the CSOs perhaps are like housed under the department, um, it's sort of the police commission view, the police commission's view, or you're comfortable with the fact that sort of that, um, or I guess one of the concerns I would have was sort of that like insular culture yes. consuming that side of the work. And like, yep. so you, uh, so what I hear you saying is that like, there's enough separation day to day that um, that culture stays healthy and focused on the sort of preventative like outreach piece. Right. Um, so the CSOs, um, I, is, so their job's a little bit different. It, it's, it could be a potential recruiting ground for a, um, a sworn officer. It gives someone an opportunity to get a taste of what it's, what it's like, what, what types of things you deal with, what you see sworn officers deal with, what you have to call sworn officers into. Um, CSLs, they have a very different mentality already based on the work that they are already doing and decided that was their calling to do. <laughs> so when they come in, they're not part of that culture that some people worry about. And they are not feeling that that is interfering with their work. And I do know that officers appreciate them because if it's a situation that is safe or can be made safe, then they can assist someone while officers are then released to go work on something else. So um, they're coming in already from a different spot. They're already coming in with the work that they do, um, a, a, as he as healers for for lack of a better word. It, it, it's a they're coming from a different different place. Um, and with regards to, to the budgeting, I mean, the police commission, we can't, we can't control the budgeting. Um, but we did voice concerns. Those concerns were addressed. Um, and I can say fully that I had the same concerns and I feel, feel comfortable with the work that they're doing because they're, they're out there, they're out in the field. I think for most of the time from or a comment by, from Zariah. Sure. Yeah. Can you all hear me okay with that? Yes. No? Okay. Um, which is, I was just gonna say to to Milo's point or to other, I had this good like I think before, very early on when I talked to um Lacey Ann Smith and even ongoing, I think that there was a little bit of a concern of the Burlington Police Department culture, which I will agree is not a healthy place right now, um, impacting the CSLs, but I also would encourage folks to maybe look at it from the other way and that the CSLs who have more of a healing mentality, right. so we don't have just history, orange, education, um, can also okay. impact the culture of the Burlington Police Department and that that's something that we maybe want. And so um, that it doesn't just go one way and in addition to all the things that Milo said, which I agree with, I'm complete. Thank you. Uh, that's a, a very good point. If you'd like to talk about it some more, let me know after the meeting. Free to do another hour phone call. Um, <laughs> how do we protect ourselves? So I don't want to sound like, the worst possible thing someone can say to me is to say, oh, you're victim shaming or you're victim blaming. I'm not doing that. I'm just saying that we need to, we're living in a certain reality right now. Um, I think the drug issues that have increased dramatically, and now we are adding meth to the picture, are going to get worse before they get better. I think that's just a hard reality. It's a hard truth. I don't like, I don't, want to lie to people, mislead people, but I don't want people to panic because I do believe that Burlington overall is still a safe place to live. I am out in these streets. I am in the park. Uh, Vermont International Film Festival was last week. I saw two films. I walked from my home in the old North End down to Main Street Landing. I walked back at night. 
by myself. Fine. I'm not worried about it. I go through City Hall Park sometimes. People offer me a little something, something. I'm like, no, thank you. I go on my way. I, uh, you know, but do things happen sometimes? Yes, they do. But I think what we need to understand is, I mean, I've always thought people are crazy for leaving the doors open. I came from New York City and we just didn't do that. Right. Um, we have to lock our doors. We have to lock. If you have a house that has a back and a front door, you have to lock both. You have to lock your windows, even if you're going for a moment, a moment, because a moment is all it takes to take something. More officers doing proactive patrols would help. It would not solve completely these crimes of opportunity where we have all these thefts. And I want to remind everyone, we're getting ready to go into a holiday season. We do more online shopping. I'm sure a lot of you have noticed these carriers, UPS, FedEx, DHL, they used, you couldn't, they wouldn't leave a package unless someone signed for it. Now they'll just leave it. They'll just leave it. And that if you're not right there, or if they don't knock the door, if you don't hear the door, those packages could be gone. So people really have to make arrangements for um, if you're not going to be there when a package is going to be delivered, you need to have that package delivered to some place where someone can sign for it and look out for it because people are going to be looking for things that they can sell, eat, or wear. So if you do have something taken, look for it. People have found things. They found things that they order, just the boxes ripped open and just a couple of blocks away. So look for it. But put let carriers know that you want to sign for packages. Um, if you have a package that's stolen, report it. Report it through the online portal because it's important for the department to track where these type of crimes are occurring and to have them tracked in the system as incidents. Let the carriers know. Let the carriers know I did not, did not get a knock on my door. I was not given the opportunity to sign for the package and it was stolen. They need to know that. Who you ordered from needs to know that. So as we get into this holiday season, I don't think these crimes, which normally go down in the winter, are necessarily going to go down to the levels that we've seen before. I think we need to be, and will we have a winter? Look how warm it was this, you know? Usually it's the cold that, discourages people, but um, we're, we're not seeing that. So that's very different. So those are really basic uh, things. You know, the mayor gets mad at me because says, anyone can tell someone to lock the door. Well, that's what we need to do because that's where we're seeing a lot of this stuff happening. Um, people have to have better locks for not only their bikes, but everything. Anything that has a serial number, you need to have a current picture of it. And you need to have it uh, like your computer. You should have a picture of your computer, but the picture of the computer shouldn't just be on the computer. It should be someplace else in case the computer goes. Anything with a serial number. If you think about all the things of value that you have that are easily, you know, can be picked up and moved and they have a serial number, do you have that log somewhere? Because sometimes things are found. Sometimes things are found in other states, but if they're not reported, then they can't be returned. So that's going to be very important. The city has a bike reporting now. Um, definitely log your bike there, but also use bike index. So so many people in the community were using bike index. Um, be aware, be aware, be aware. Uh, know your neighbors, um, share with your neighbors uh, and people that you trust your, 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 if you're traveling, leave lights on, leave radios playing loud, you know, have your, your homes have a sense of someone being present. Um, motion lights, all these things are our deterrents until we get our force back to higher numbers. But even if we had the higher numbers, we can't have an officer next to every unlocked door. We can't have an officer next to every uh, bicycle that doesn't have a good lock door is unlocked. We, we can't have them present next to every package that's just left in the, the open. That's just not realistic. And that is never going to happen. So we, we just have to be, um, 
aware of that. Yes. Everybody We're running over. Yes. Okay. Um, I will send a document about detailing what the commission does uh, that could possibly be posted. Um, but I just briefly will say uh, primarily we work on complaints. We work on reviewing directives and policies uh, whenever we can. Uh, we've been trying to work in particular on oversight and developing oversight uh, within the city for things that are going on. So uh, maybe I can come back next time and do more detail on that. But thank you all again for listening. And um, I do have a couple of emails I have to respond to and I have to apologize for that because I've been making the rounds in addition to working and in addition to doing my radio shows. So it's been uh, sucking up the time a little bit, but I've been enjoying it. And I thank you all for the time and the feedback. Thank you very much. All right. Uh, the last item on our agenda is the Burlington Electric Department. And you guys are going to. Talk about electrification. Yeah, it's going to be riveting. It's going to be All right. a really great way to wrap it up. Do you want to, is it okay to stand or what do you think? Okay, okay stand. Yes. Everybody? Would you like? You, right here is fine. Right here. Right yeah, here. you can bring another chair. Okay. okay. We'll, uh, thank we'll you. Thanks. Yeah. yeah, thank you so much for um, for the time tonight, Carol and Tom, for, for putting us on the agenda and enabling us to come and share some time with you. So I'm Jennifer Green and I work. Um, at the Burlington Electric Department, I'm the Director of Sustainability for the city, and I'm so pleased to be here with General Manager Darren Springer. So I know we have 20 minutes, and this is how we sort of see it shaking out. I can give you, put things in context for you, and then turn it over to Darren, who will describe some of the electrification policies that we're considering uh, per the request of the city council. And then we would like to use the last bit of time of our 20 minutes to hear from you and to answer any questions you may have. I'm wondering how that sounds as an, as an agenda. Okay, great. Um, so I said I was gonna frame it up. So I'm sure you're all aware that uh, we have a net zero energy strategy in Burlington. So it's a very ambitious strategy and it's on the coattails of our 2014 success story, which of course is becoming the first city in the country to source 100% of our electricity from renewables. So when we sort of achieve that success, we decided to take it to the next level, which was to essentially transition away from fossil fuels in the ground transportation and built environment. Unfortunately, at, at BED, um, we have an energy efficiency utility, which enable, enables us to invest in energy efficiency. And we have resources from the state, which we refer to as sort of tier three, to help with strategic electrification. And this comes in the form of you know, rebates and incentives. And that's all very helpful and good. But the city council understands that if we are going to really achieve net zero, it's going to be, it's going to require some policy as well. So they have asked us to do some research and to start crafting um, some potential policy recommendations. So before we go to the city council, they've asked us to come to you to make the rounds. And I, I do want to say this is my award. So I'm especially happy that we're sort of kicking it off here. Um, to make the rounds and to, to garner um, feedback from the community. So, so if anybody has questions with that, otherwise I'll turn it over to Darren who can outline sort of our thinking and when where we are in, in our thought formation. Okay, Darren. Sit down here. Hi, uh, good evening, everybody. Um, great to be with you. I'm Ward 7, not Ward 1-8, but <laughs> lovely to be here and uh, don't hold it against me. Um, <laughs> So really what we're kind of to drill down, what we're doing is related to the vote that we had back in March of 2021, uh, where the community gave about 65% approval uh, for a charter change. Uh, so we went to Montpelier, got approval from the legislature and the governor earlier this year, and we got uh, charter change approved that gives Burlington the ability to regulate emissions in buildings, uh, which is something that really no other community has in Vermont. So we have a unique opportunity to do policy work around uh, reducing uh, emissions in buildings. Uh, there was also an advisory ballot question. Uh, it was question seven, same uh, ballot that also was approved that said, as part of this work, we want to dedicate resources uh, to those in the community who might be lower income, might be marginalized. And so 
Our work stems from those two ballot items passing and a resolution from the city council in May uh, that asked us to look at new construction, existing buildings, uh, city buildings, major renovations, and come back with some recommendations. Um, we put together an interim report in July that's available. I think it'll be available maybe on our website uh, if it's not already, but it's on board docs. And uh, in uh, about a little less than a month, we're going to hopefully put together some final recommendations for the council to consider. And in the new construction area, we already require uh, renewable heating uh, as a, a kind of primary heating source has to be renewable. We passed that uh, last year uh, with the mayor and the city council. Um, so one of the things we're thinking about under this new charter change would be to go bigger uh, with new construction and say, if you're going to build new in the city of Burlington, everything has to be renewable within the building, uh, not just the heating system, but the, the cooking, the appliances, the all the different, the water heating. And when we say renewable, the definition that's in law right now in Burlington that's in ordinance is very inclusive. It includes uh, things that are powered by electricity because we're 100% renewable. So uh, heat pumps, uh, heat pump water heaters, ground source uh, geothermal heat pumps, those all count. Uh, but also if you use a conventional system and you're purchasing a renewable fuel, uh, like renewable gas or biodiesel, that counts. Uh, if you're using advanced wood heating, that counts. There's a lot of different ways to get to renewable. It's not just electric. Um, so that's one idea that we have is to say that if you're building new, everything should be renewable. And one of the tools that we have under the charter change would be to say, if you're not able to achieve that, there could be some sort of a carbon impact fee, a carbon pollution impact fee, essentially, that the city could charge. And the use of the proceeds of those fee could be consistent with that advisory ballot question that I mentioned. So the city might be able to dedicate some resources uh, to helping uh, perhaps with renewable energy projects or weatherization or energy efficiency for low-income households, for example. Um, there could also be resources for the city to fund its own efforts to uh, move its own fleet or its own buildings towards um, you know, efficiency and renewables as well. Um, so that's one thing we're thinking about and we, we'd love your feedback on. And the other piece uh, is really related to existing buildings. Uh, we're trying to focus in on buildings that are 50,000 square feet or larger. Uh, really start with the largest buildings in the city. We're not looking at residential. We're not looking at multifamily. We're not looking at rental at this point. Uh, we're really focused on larger buildings that are commercial or industrial. There's maybe about 200 buildings that kind of fit this profile. A lot of them are going to be managed by a very small number of entities. If you think about it, we're, we're talking about potentially uh, the university, the hospital, the city, the school district, Champlain College, uh, there will be some others as well. And one of the things we're thinking about there is the idea that starting uh, perhaps in 2024, if this was ultimately adopted by the city and approved by voters, uh, again, town meeting day 2023, uh, when one of those buildings would go to pull a permit uh, for a new heating system or a new water heating system, same deal, uh, it has to be renewable or there would be some sort of a carbon impact fee. And the idea would be, uh, to try to really uh, alter the capital planning process uh, and say, hey, if you're going to be planning for your new uh, boiler or your new heating system down the road, could be five years, could be 10 years, the city's asking you to go renewable or to plan that there's going to be a fee associated with that. And so that's the other big piece of what we're thinking about. Um, I think that the great thing about what's going on in Burlington is, is what we're doing here is having impact uh, outside of Burlington as well. Uh, I don't know if folks are aware, but in South Burlington, they're actually in the process of adopting a renewable heating requirement for new construction based on what happened here in Burlington uh, back in 2021. So we've been uh, hearing from folks there who are interested and in asking questions. So certainly uh, what we do here hopefully can benefit our community and our climate goals, but maybe also contribute to what's going on in other communities uh, around the state as well. Um, so let me stop there. Uh, that's just just a short summary, we definitely will go into more detail uh, in the report that we give to the council, but really, uh, we just want to hear from you uh, at the MPA. Is this something that sounds, uh, you know, something that you, you sound, uh, you look at, you think, okay, this is something I could be supportive of. Do you have questions? Do you have feedback? Do you have a critique? Um, we're, we're just here to listen at this point. So thanks for, thanks for having us. And I know we're the last item on the agenda. So sorry to, sorry to stand in the way of you, Jerry. <laughs> Yeah, no, this is really exciting and I appreciate it. I mean, I had a few, I guess you answered the question around natural gas and biofuels being included and counted as renewable. Um, and I'm assuming hydro makes up a significant portion of our like quote renewable electricity. And I guess I would just throw out there that, you know, if we look 
if we really truly count emissions and look outside of Vermont as well, impact on indigenous communities in Canada um, and just methane releases from hydro, I think we're the only New England state that counts hydro as renewable um, as part of emission reduction goals. Um, so I'm throwing that out there. I don't know what the I'm assuming I think there's going to be some movement in Montpelier in the coming legislative session to increase tier two versus tier one, uh, making up our energy. But and I'm still learning the res because it's Rex and the renewable energy standard are very convoluted <laughs> and hard to wrap your head around. But um, I guess I'm wondering if there's levers that the city itself without Montpelier can use to really focus on things like geothermal things like solar um, and actually like producing solar energy that we actually use here because a lot of our solar energy and renewables are going out of state. Um, so I, I guess that's a critique and part of a question. And then the only other thing, yeah, you talked about like um, impact fees and fees in general as we're like transitioning buildings. And I wonder how you all are thinking about um, Right, like obviously you have a certain amount of wealth if you're owning any property in the city, but there's clearly folks on a fixed income, retired, um, young families that, you know, they're, they're month to month and they're upfront money. I know there's like probably rebates and stuff, but it's just a little tighter. Um, and so how do we make those fees progressive in nature and, and not sort of, you know, working class people, folks in Canada, indigenous communities who are suffering from the expansion of hydro up there sort of are the least responsible arguably for the situation we're in. So how do we make sure that, or what are the levers potentially that we have locally um, to, you know, as, as imperfectly as we can uh, reduce that impact on working people? So a couple, couple pieces there I'll try to respond to. Um, so Burlington's 100% renewable. Um, we get, uh, as, as pretty much every utility in the state, gets some power from Hydro-Quebec. Ours is usually between 10 and 15%. It's not the majority of our portfolio. Um, most, uh, the biggest source of our electricity comes from the McNeil plant, which is right here, uh, just down the road. And we do have solar, we do have wind, uh, we do have hydro, and we're 100% renewable when it comes to our generation, but we're also 100% renewable when it comes to renewable credits. Um, so we're 100% we're renewable in both cases. I think every resource has some carbon impact. Uh, solar has a carbon impact, wind has a carbon impact, hydro, uh, biomass, nuclear, fossil fuels have the worst carbon impact. So I think we really, there is no perfect energy source. Um, and I think solar has value, but when we think about um, what's coming up this winter, uh, other states are seeing double and triple digit rate increases uh, because the fossil fuel prices on the grid are spiking to historic highs. And the fact that we have the McNeil resource and other resources that are renewable and able to run during the winter time is really what's going to insulate us. We, we have a 3.95% rate increase uh, in this current fiscal year. And we definitely are seeing like 60, 70% rate increases in some of the other states in New England. So solar is good, but it's not going to address that issue. You really need a diverse portfolio uh, to really be able to manage uh, when it comes to renewables. And then in terms of the fee, um, there would be no fee. And I, I want to be really clear because this is an important point. There's no fee proposed, no regulation proposed on, on homes, on small businesses, uh, on, on any institutions uh, that are below 50,000 square feet. Um, what we're talking about with existing buildings is just having this policy applied to a couple hundred buildings in the city that are 50,000 square feet or above. Um, so for new construction, it would apply more broadly to pretty much anything you would build. But for existing buildings, uh, you know, this would not affect residential, would not affect small businesses, uh, because we really think that, you know, to, to really model this, we want to work with the buildings that have the resources to potentially invest and help make the transition. So it's an important point because that'll come up a lot, I think. Uh, we've got uh, Sharon, you've got a question. And then you hear her. Um, yes, I do. Um, it's really good to, I can see you guys, I don't have my camera on, but it's good to see both Jen and Darren. Um, my question has to do with impact fees. Um, I understand, I mean, and I'm glad because I, early on before I um, got off the council, I worked on new building construction as, as Darren recalls and trying to get this in place. Um, but there was a lot of work that had to be done. And, and Darren is very thorough as we all appreciate in making sure that 
the proposal, the policy is uh, well thought out and we, and we know what the impact will be. But as far as impact fees for now, existing buildings of 50,000 square feet or, or greater, um, is there, I, impact fees give you a pool of money. And yes, you can use that to help people, potentially some people, uh, low income people. Um, but I'd rather not have the building get a pass. Is there a way? Have you thought I'm sure you've thought through this, but is there a way that there is some lower interest if, if it's a financial hurdle or barrier? Is there a way that there can be a prolonged payment payback? but still have them comply because I, I really feel that we can't push this off <laughs> much further. And I just wondered if you thought of any of that and is that a, at all a viable idea? Thank you. Thanks, Sharon. Uh, it's good to hear from you. Um, it, it's a good point. It gives me an opportunity to be uh, clearer maybe about the fee. So the, the way we're considering structuring the fee is if you're going to pull a permit, whether for a new building or an existing building for a fossil fuel heating system, we're going to look at the life of that heating system, 25 years for you know, a typical heating system. We're going to look at the fossil fuel use and the carbon associated with that heating system. And we're going to have a net present value fee right up front when you go to put it in. And the idea would be, if this was adopted, um, would be that you would look at your renewable option and you would look at your fossil fuel option. And we're going to hopefully level the playing field uh, significantly for the renewable option by having that impact fee really represent the lifetime value of the carbon that's going to be put out and hopefully uh, make the capital decision easier in favor of a renewable solution. And we mentioned there are several of them. Uh, so the idea here isn't necessarily to just collect revenue. Uh, although there will probably be instances perhaps where somebody chooses to pay the fee instead of uh, going renewable, the idea would really be that the fee would uh, help make that decision to go renewable more economically attractive uh, at, at the end of the day. Erhard, you got a question? Thanks, Tom. Uh, thanks, Jen. Thanks, uh, Darren. Um, I uh, I do have a question, but before I, I say, uh, put out my question, I just wanted to um, remind folks, um, going back a little bit in history, we actually set the city on this net zero path about 30 years ago. Uh, and it was, you know, folks like um, Peter Okowski when he was uh, city councilor and, and Sharon and her early years, and I, I'll take some credit for this myself. Um, we uh, uh, basically bought into, uh, arranged for the future um, uh, uh, hydropower from Winooski one to be uh, part of the mix that Burlington has. We also defeated a uh, what would have been a horrendously uh, polluting trash burning plant in um, the Intervale and um, came up with the idea of McNeil. McNeil is not great because it does also uh, also pollute and put out some, you know, put put out gases that um, we don't necessarily want to uh, put out into the environment. And then the other things that we did was we said no to Hydro-Quebec uh, back then. We refused to um, contract um, with uh, with Hydro-Quebec for, now we are getting it in the mix and um, I'm, I'm going to get to my question in two seconds. Um, the other thing that we did was um, we, uh, uh, bonded for uh, for demand side uh, management for for energy efficiency improvements that uh, set uh, ultimately set BED on the path to becoming an energy efficiency utility, um, and you know a lot of that's thanks to. Uh, uh, one uh, fellow who's not with us uh, anymore, Blair Ham Hamilton and uh, Beth Sachs, who uh, started the Vermont Energy Investment Corporation many years ago. So just a little bit, bit of history. I just want to make sure folks uh, understood that this all started 30, uh, 30 years ago. And uh, thanks to 
to you guys for you know continuing in that in that path. My question is uh, to uh, to Carter's point and uh, Darren, you're saying that uh, I think uh, what was the ten or twenty percent of our mix is uh, is coming from uh, from hydro. Is that coming from hydro Quebec? Um, and is that because ISO New England uh, basically um, gives us uh, certain uh, a certain mix, which will include um, natural gas. Uh, we also have coal fired plants in New England. Um, so we're are we getting some of the things that we wouldn't really want in the mix um, because we're part of ISO New England and that's dictating uh, part of uh, part of what we get uh, um, uh, how, how we how we um, generate electricity for the city of Burlington. Oh, it's a good question, and Earhart, it's good good history too. And Blair and Beth did fantastic work, and appreciate all the things that have been done. Uh, we we inherited a great situation at Burlington Electric. Um, so when when we think of our portfolio, ten to fifteen percent is from Hydro Quebec under contract that the state had essentially uh, encouraged a number of years ago the utilities to sign a long term agreement with Hydro Quebec that I think runs through twenty thirty eight. So as much as some folks may like or dislike it. That contract exists uh, and is running at various percentages for different utilities through 2038. In terms of hydro overall, it's more like a third of our portfolio when you count Winooski One and some other Vermont hydro that we get um, combined with the Hydro Quebec and some uh, hydropower from NIPA in New York. Um, and then uh, a little more than a third coming from McNeil, um, a small slice from solar that's growing, but relatively small when you look at overall production. And then we have three wind projects, two here in Vermont, one in Maine. That kind of constitutes our portfolio. And we're actually more than 100% renewable. We actually have more renewable resources than what we need to serve our customers. Uh, so when we're able to, we can sell that into the regional grid and help to even further decarbonize the region um, and, and hopefully bring in revenue for our customers that helps make our rates uh, you know, more stable, more competitive. Uh, being renewable has is, is been a positive for us financially, uh, generally speaking, and is, it's seen by our credit rating agency as a positive. Uh, they cite it as a good, um, you know, a good thing from a risk perspective in a world that's going to be focused more and more on carbon reduction. So um, I'm very proud of the portfolio, including McNeil, including, including all the resources that we have, because I think McNeil provides a really important uh, insulation against those regional rate impacts in the wintertime. But yeah, appreciate that. That's good context and good history. Kathy? Yeah, I had a, um, two questions. Um, on one, I have seen the numbers of people with COPD and asthma. Yes, the numbers have gone down, but it's younger people that it's affecting now. And most of those our children and young people in the old North End that are the least people that can afford to have that. That's one. And you can maybe tell me something different or why aren't we putting more filters on those, the gases that are being let off. But also, I also heard that McNeil is going to do heating of stuff up on the hill. Yep. And when you do that, you are going to start using more natural gas. Okay, let me and, address both of those. Okay. Those are good questions. Okay, um, so in terms of McNeil, and a lot of folks, and you know, I, I can see McNeil from my neighborhood, everybody sees McNeil. A lot of times when you see stuff coming up in the air, it's actually water vapor. Uh, most of the time, what you see coming up is, is water vapor. It's not pollution, although it can look that way, you know, when you're seeing it, particularly on a cold day. Um, we did invest in... Uh, selective catalytic reduction unit back in 2008, it was about a $12 million investment that lowered uh, nitrogen oxides to about one third of the permitted level. So we're well below kind of the permitted level there. And in terms of particulate matter, which is uh, one of the other uh, pollution sources that you look at, I think we've been typically around one tenth of the permitted level. Um, so the state uh, uh, public health department put out a memo uh, just recently in response to kind of a similar question and said that they didn't see a correlation of health impacts around McNeil, and that actually uh, things like wood stoves that are being used with far less kind of pollution control technology around the state might be a bigger source of local air pollution than something like the McNeil plant or the Rygate plant uh, over in uh, the Northeast Kingdom. So I think when we think about the health impacts, and I, I want to be very transparent, uh, you know, there is some emissions coming from McNeil. I just mentioned we're lower than our permitted level, but there is some emissions uh, as a combustion resource. 
There's also a bunch of vehicles driving around that are combusting fossil fuel, lots of lawn equipment, lots of heating systems combusting fossil fuel, and that's having an impact on air quality as well. So I'm not aware of any health study that's kind of linked any of the outcomes you mentioned specifically to McNeil. Um, if we learned something like that, we'd want to be responsive to it. But we've made investments in the plant predating my tenure at BED that are helping to reduce the emissions. Um, in terms of what you were mentioning is district heating. Uh, which is another thing goes back kind of really to the, the time period Erhard was mentioning. When the plant was built, it was supposed to have a capacity to not only produce electricity, but produce steam that could be used for heating to displace more fossil fuel. Uh, never happened. There have been a lot of studies. And when I became general manager in 2018, I committed, we're going to do everything possible to make this happen. And we've been working at it. We've gone through three different rounds of feasibility work with um, a, co a company called Evergreen Energy out of Minnesota uh, that has a similar plant in St. Paul, Minnesota. And uh, we actually had a letter agreement this summer with the hospital and UVM and Evergreen and Vermont Gas to uh, do some additional work around this. And we're making quite a lot of progress. If we're successful, it would carry steam from the McNeil plant that's produced from wood chips. Um, we would not be using additional natural gas at McNeil at all. And if you think about it, it wouldn't make sense to do that because it's a $40 million project to build the infrastructure, the steam pipe infrastructure to the hospital and UVM, which are the main buildings we would serve. And they already have natural gas. So it doesn't, there's no economic reason that we would try to build pipes to carry natural gas to customers that already have natural gas. And we're not interested in that. We're hundred percent renewable. We're not interested in doing that. So the only way that project makes sense for us is if we can use steam from the McNeil plant to displace natural gas use at the hospital and at UVM, lower the city's emissions uh, in the commercial sector by around 15% on the higher end, 11% on the lower end. Really the single biggest step we could take, I think, to reduce emissions uh, from natural gas in the city. So if you hear that, please know that is not what we're interested in doing. And uh, I'll never sign an agreement that does that promise you that. All right. I think we have time for one other question. I, Sharon, you had your hand up, but you put it back down. I'm sorry. Are you talking to me? Yeah. You had your hand up and then you put it down. Did you have another question? Uh, no, I don't. I, I'm okay. sorry to confuse All you. Right. didn't mean to. I will ask a question if there's oh, another one. Go ahead. I just wanted to ask if, if, if there, was, there had been some talk about hot water um, and using the, the condenser essentially heat, right? Is that off the table now? Is it only generating steam? To For the district heating project? Yeah. Yeah, it was. You're correct. It was a hot water project the last time they had looked at it, 2016, 2017. And when we looked at it, uh, it really makes sense to do steam because McNeil produces steam and the hospital uses steam. And so the idea of converting to hot water and converting back to steam was not as efficient. Um, so what we want to do is take the steam from McNeil, get it to the hospital where they can use it and get it to UVM buildings that can use it as well. So it'd be a steam-based system now. Which yep. means more burning more wood, essentially. It's about, uh, if you think of it in terms of fuel supply, we would use perhaps around 4% uh, more fuel at the McNeil plant um, in terms of wood, or about maybe a, like a week or week and a half's worth of additional supply uh, to be able to do the district heating project. Yeah. 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 Um, so quick question. Can you define, we are a city that is completely renewable? And does that include the buildings that the city owns, like all the schools and City Hall, for example, the BET building and public works? What, what does it actually mean that we're a renewable city? Right. We're 100% we're renewable with our electricity. That's what we've accomplished. Uh, in 2014, we were recognized as, as meeting that, and we've done it every year since. Um, the net zero goal that we talk about is, is what you're talking about, is how can we be renewable, not just with electricity, but in our buildings, in our vehicles, um, and really use that supply that we have now, the 100% renewable supply, to help us um, in those efforts. Because uh, we, we still use fossil fuel in buildings all around the city. We use it for vehicles. Uh, so we're not renewable in those sectors at this point. We're going to have to go. Well, um, I think that is our final question. Uh, thank you very much. For, thank for you. Coming. Thank you all. Thank you. But I do have a question. Uh, huh. After the meeting, <laughs> when, when, when do we expect another update from you?
Oh, um, well, we're going to hopefully bring a report to the city council on the 5th and, uh, um, December. of December on this particular topic. And then uh, we'd be happy to come back and talk more about it if you're interested. Okay. Yep. Great. Thank Thanks. You.